thank you very much, Florian, for your introductory remarks. And now I'd like to introduce our discussants, which are Vanya Chalovich Markovic, who is executive director of the Montenegrin anti corruption NGO MANS and is a member of the Montenegrin National Council for the Fight Against High Level Corruption. Besides her continuous work in the country, she has also worked as an anti corruption expert and consultant for different international organizations, such as the World Bank and the European Commission. She studied economics at the University of Montenegro. Jelena Jankic is part time professor in the Global Governance Program at the Robert Schumann. Center of the European University Institute in Florence, Italy, where she is co-director of the Global Citizenship Observatory, Global CIT. Her research interests include citizenship, nationalism, mobility, and migration. She has published extensively on politics and society of Montenegro and the Western Balkans. Jovana Marovic is the executive director of the Montenegro-based Think Tank Political Network, and worked as an advisor mainly in the field of European integration with different government bodies in the country. Furthermore, she was a research coordinator at the think tank and research group Institute Alternative. Jovana is a member of the working group for Chapter 23, Judiciary and Fundamental Rights, within the Montenegrin accession negotiations for EU membership. She obtained her PhD in political science at the University of Belgrade. Kenneth Morrison is the professor of modern Southeast European history at De Montfort University in the United Kingdom. He was specialist advisor to the House of Lords International Relations Committee for their The UK and the Future of the Western Balkans Inquiry and is the author of five books, including Nationalism, Identity and Statehood in Post-Yugoslav Montenegro. Thank you very much for joining us here. And now I will hand over to Claudia who is going to give us an overview about how this evening will proceed. Yes, thank you very much, Finn. So hello and a warm welcome from me as well. And many thanks to the panelists of this afternoon and to the Center for Southeast European Studies for making this event possible. So before we get started, a few organizational notes uh, from my side. So the event will start with presentations by the panelists, each of about seven minutes, which are followed by a brief discussion between the four of them. So the last half an hour, as Florian already said, is um, reserved for Q&A with the audience. So for this purpose, you, the audience, can submit your questions um, via the chat window at the bottom. So you can submit your questions at any point throughout the event, which I will then collect and pass on to the individual speakers or the entire panel. So when you submit your questions, please make sure that you give you a name if you haven't registered under your full name and affiliation. And I kindly ask you to keep your questions short and to the point so that we can consider as many questions as possible. And of course, you can also use the raise your hand function and ask uh, your question yourself. But please be aware that we will record uh, this, this event. So we will now start with the presentations in the following order. Um, we will first hear a presentation by Kenneth, then Jelena, Jovana and Vanya. And so without further ado, I would like to turn over to Kenneth. I must unmute myself. And um, thank you very much for the very kind introductions. Um, what we're going to be doing today is obviously discussing contemporary events in, in Montenegro, but I'm going to begin by, by going back a little bit uh, to talk about what's happened uh, since independence uh, in 2006. So, of course, tomorrow marks 15 years. Um, well, in fact, it's the third, uh, the third of June, marking 15 years since Montenegro formally declared uh, independence following the uh, referendum that took place on the 21st of May uh, 2006. Now, of course, I have limited time uh, in which to discuss a 15 year uh, period, but I'll be discussing some of Montenegro's trajectory since uh, the independence referendum, some of the key events and some of the shifts that have brought us to the current situation, uh, which of course we'll have the opportunity to discuss uh, in more detail uh, as we proceed. So if we cast our minds back to, to 2006 and the Declaration of Independence, well, Montenegro rapidly joined key international organizations. Uh, and of course, at that time, the DPS-led government adopted a, an ambiguous Euro-Atlantic foreign policy orientation uh, with European Union and NATO membership central to it. 
of course, we know that the, the former EU membership uh, enjoyed overwhelming support from the, the population, but they were more divided uh, over the latter, uh, over the issue of uh, NATO membership. But very quickly, foreign direct investment increased, the tourism sector boomed, and certainly the e early years of, of independence seemed uh, that Montenegro was on a, an exceptionally positive uh, trajectory, if one didn't look too closely. Domestically, however, the DPS and, and Milo Djukanovic, uh, who of course rotated between the role of Prime Minister and President with a couple of short sabbaticals, um, during which he remained, uh, and nevertheless, the, the, the chairman uh, of the DPS dominated uh, the political scene. And of course, the argument that was made by some pro-independence campaigners in 2006 that independence would lead to a sort of recalibration of the political landscape and that the power of the DPS would gradually diminish proved overly optimistic. Instead, the DPS became consolidated as a state party, the winners of the referendum and the self-proclaimed guardians of Montenegrin uh, statehood uh, and national identity. And of course, as a consequence, they consolidated their power, though of course they had to rely on coalitions with smaller parties to govern. But the lines between the party and the state became increasingly opaque and the system of patronage that developed uh, became impenetrable to those really without party connections. And until 2020, the opposition remained weak, divided, and really unable to effectively challenge uh, the DPS. Now, there were a number of protests that took place, 2012, 2015, but the, the anti-government protests in October 2015 were a clear sign that there existed some uh, possibility for change. So the destruction of the so-called tent city in Podgorica and the outrage generated by the violence uh, meted out by the police thereafter gave the opposition some momentum, although the DPS, of course, soon regained the initiative after the events uh, outside the, the, the parliament uh, the parliament building. Of course, there were violent clashes with the, the, the police uh, outside that building. Now, 2016, I've been going to Montenegro every year, uh, or several times every year, in fact, uh, since uh, independence. But it was really noticeable that during the 10 year anniversary of independence, I, I was quite struck by how relatively muted some of the celebrations were, not in the media, of course, but on the streets. And although there was a genuine sense of pride uh, among uh, many Montenegrins that the first decade of independence had been a success, it had increasingly come to be viewed as a DPS project. And Montenegro was a, a private state, uh, in essence, controlled by a small, powerful elite. Now, those opposition politicians who opposed Montenegro's accession to NATO were particularly angered because the government were taking uh, the country into the Western military alliance uh, against their will. And you could really feel in 2015, 2016, the, the, the tensions uh, ratcheting, uh, ratcheting up quite, quite significantly. Now, that perception that the DPS were kind of, you know, pushing this through uh, the parliament, and of course, the opposition were often boycotting parliament, pushing this through the parliament, that perception, and in a series of corruption scandals, such as the audio recording scandal, um, did much to undermine uh, the DPS. Um, despite the fact that, of course, in October 2016, during the parliamentary elections, that's the elections during which an alleged Russian-backed coup d'etat uh, took place that aimed to derail Montenegro's NATO membership. Um, that election was won narrowly by the DPS and their allies. And of course, less than a year later, uh, Montenegro, uh, Montenegro joined NATO. But it was ultimately this ill-judged attempt by the DPS-led government to push through a new law on religious freedoms uh, in 2019 that facilitated a political union between the opposition and the Serbian Orthodox Church. And of course, this gave the opposition the momentum they needed to achieve the country's first change of government through the mechanism of democratic elections uh, in August 2020. Florian mentioned briefly that th there'd been no uh, a change of government through the mechanism of democratic elections since the first multi-party elections uh, in, in 1990. But of course, it goes back much further to you know, the end of the Second World War. Essentially, there'd been no change of government uh, in Montenegro since then. So while the election results were regarded by many observers as a new beginning for Montenegro, in reality, the new government faced, and they continue to face, really very significant challenges, uh, with a majority of only one seat in parliament, 
uh, relations within the new government, despite a shared antipathy towards the DPS and a desire uh, to keep them out of power, haven't always been uh, stable or haven't always appeared stable. Meanwhile, the once all powerful DPS, who are now, of course, in opposition, uh, argue that the country is under attack from Serbia, from Russia, and by uh, a pro-Serbian or Russian government that negates uh, a separate Montenegrin national identity, which is to destroy Montenegro's statehood and reverse the country's Euro-Atlantic orientation. Although there does not, at least at this stage, um, uh, appear to be a, a radical uh, change in that foreign policy orientation. So just very quickly to, to sum up, 15 years after the referendum, you know, Montenegro is still facing some very significant challenges. Uh, corruption and organized crime, which Vanya will talk about in some detail later. The EU accession process has been slower than expected. The new government has a tiny majority in parliament and the cleavages with regard to identity have become increasingly pronounced. Finally, the economic picture looks less promising or less than promising, not just because Montenegro's tourism sector has been and will continue to be hugely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, but because the country's public debt levels are uncomfortably high. Uh, and I'm sure that Vanya, for example, will discuss the Barbo Yari uh, uh, road construction and uh, the Chinese yeah. debt issue separately. So, thank you very much, Kenneth, for your uh, overview. It was very interesting. Thank you. And now I would uh, like to hand over to Yelena. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So, good afternoon, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here and actually not see anyone else on the screen except for my face. But in any case, I'd like to thank Florian, uh, Finn, and Claudia for organizing this wonderful and exciting panel. So, now just brace yourselves because for the next seven minutes, I'll tell you everything you needed or wanted to know about the national identity question in Montenegro and never dare to ask. So, in other words, uh, I will speak about the reconstruction of identities uh, that are tagged as national ones during the statehood and identity division in Montenegro, highlighting legacies and challenges that this issue poses um, nowadays. Now, that's the first part of my speech, and then I will move on to briefly reflecting on some of these symbolic elements of governance in the present day that play uh, on and around this national question. In so doing, I will uh, highlight that while we have seen the demise of the DPS after 30 years of governance in Montenegro, we can actually see very similar power mechanics, if you wish, that underpin the national question and keep it alive. And in my view, it is something that prevents Montenegro from uh, truly uh, embarking upon a democratic democratic. So just for some of you who, who are not as acquainted with the politics and society of Montenegro, let's try and go back to basics. So what is the national question in Montenegro? Um, it's a tough one, but to put it simply, it's the question whether Montenegro national identity exists as a separate one or whether it is a subset of the Serb national identity. Now, Kenneth has written a wonderful book that covers this topic, and it has been covered in some of my own writings. And I guess that many of you here will have read and written about, about this issue. And obviously, this national identity question has been supported by, uh, let's say, different historical accounts of, of, this, of this issue. But more importantly, these different historical accounts were revived and invigorated in the polarized political landscape in the late 1990s and thereafter. So essentially when Djukanovic progressively embarked upon the quest for, um, quest for independent statehood of, of Montenegro. Now, within this context, within the context in which the DPS uh, in a way started at some point to actively uh, push for Montenegrin uh, independence, uh, the Montenegrin identity was reconstituted uh, to, in a way, stand for 
uh, this quest for independence politically. And obviously this was all then played back into the political objectives of the DPS, which this reconstruction of identity uh, essentially uh, served. Now, um, as a result, Montenegrin identity was reconstructed as inclusive of the, let's say, uh, non-Serb minorities. Uh, and symbolically, this has been done through matters of religion that we will touch upon, I guess, in the discussion, but also by reconstituting the key symbols of what are perceived to be national categories. So uh, the symbols such as the flag or the national anthem, the uh, various heraldry, et cetera, et cetera, but also through the question of instituting uh, a separate Montenegrin language. So uh, this is what happened before, but what happened back uh, in, since August, 2020, uh, since the DPS lost the elections. Now, obviously, in a very uncertain and depolarized political context, uh, policy reversals of these symbolic markers of nationhood uh, would have destabilized something that was already a very heterogeneous and ideologically diverse coalition. So what happens then is that we can see two things. Uh, one would be the mobilization of those associating with the Montenegrin identity category uh, as a result of a sort of a perceived threat. And this is something that we could see, for instance, in protests um, after the announcement on changes to the law on citizenship. And I'll be happy to speak about that in the Q&A session. Uh, and the second, have been the elements, again, of this symbolic reconstruction of identity as an affirmation of the political power. So I've briefly touched upon uh, how um, the DPS has done it throughout the late 1990s and the 2000s, or actually until 2020, if, if you wish. Uh, but also, the new government seems to be employing uh, mechanisms that are not as different uh, from those that have been used uh, by the DPS, but they are a little bit more subtle. So we can see the shift from the red to blue on all the, let's say, communications from the government. We can see the dominance of the Cyrillic script uh, in quite a lot of the official communications. Uh, we have, again, the question of church and religion, which has become a part of the government, uh, of the government's uh, discourse. And most recently, and this is something that has become uh, very much a subject of political debate, uh, it has been the uh, new Air Montenegro logo. Uh, so I guess uh, that there are issues of continuity and change that you can see over there, especially as, as, regard, as regards the colors and shapes uh, of this. Uh, of this new logo also at the symbolical level of nationhood for, for those who have followed the Montenegrin politics in the mid 2000s uh, may remember the discord over the shades of blue uh, between Serbia and Montenegro. So now just to conclude, uh, national identity as any other identity category is obviously malleable. What we could see in Montenegro uh, is that for as long as the national question is incited and kept alive by political elites, there is and will be very little room for democracy and progress because essentially these divisions best serve the objectives of power hungry elites. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jelena. Um, and now I will pass over to Jovana. Thank you, Ken. Um, so good afternoon, afternoon to all. It's also my pleasure to be here today and to discuss situation uh, in Montenegro as always. And to answer the question from the, the title of the panel, is this new beginning for Montenegro? It is for sure. So being able to change the government after 30 years 
is something which should be considered as a new beginning for Montenegro. But there are some positive developments, there are some negative trends and developments, and trying to, to um, highlight them, uh, let's say that the positive thing is that now people in Montenegro really believe that the government can be changed through elections. The recent public opinion poll which was conducted uh, for the BIPAC um, shows that 80% of uh, citizens in Montenegro now believe in the change through elections. The second thing is that, it, which is uh, something uh, to be used in the region, uh, especially in Serbia and the, the, the other countries, that it is possible to change the government uh, through elections, even though there is uneven playing field, even there is no, uh, there are no conditions for free and fair elections. And the third positive thing uh, when speaking in, ge in general is that uh, it is possible uh, uh, the way the, the, the power was um, uh, changed and uh, it was transferred to the new ruling majority in Montenegro was in a peaceful manner. That's something which is really a sign of, the, of democracy in Montenegro. But when it comes to how the new government is actually uh, fulfilling their obligations, how they are doing their job in the cabinet. There are a lot of, uh, let's say, negative uh, trends and negative things. The first thing is that there is exclusive decision making, that civil society was not consulted uh, uh, during the, the amendments and during the changes of the important laws such, for example, the law on freedom of religion, which was changed in, in uh, December, last December, uh, in a way, you know, like the, 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 the law, which was really uh, problematic for polarization of the country, which was one of the corner stores and one of the, of the reasons why the government was changed. Uh, it was expected with such a legitimacy, with such support from the streets and such a uh, result from the elections, that the new government will uh, deal with this law in different manner. The same applies to the law on civil servants and employees, which was changed by lowering criteria for employment in public administration, and now is used for party employment. Party employment was one of the of the big obstacles for the previous government. One of of the pillars of their power. And uh, um, the current ruling majority uh, criticized them sharply during the previous period, the period because of the, of the party employment. They are using the same mechanisms and patterns now in the new government. Then the next thing is that there is also selective implementation of the law, and especially when it comes to public gatherings. And that is something which is also connected with church and the, the statements by the prime minister, how the uh, believers and, and uh, the, uh, the uh, members of the church are protected and they are not like equal before the law. They, they are like somehow protected by the law and by the government. And that's something which is also problematic in terms of that there is no currently uh, the, the line between the church and the government in Montenegro. What is also problematic is that uh, um, in a way uh, there is no strategy for the strengthening of the rule of law in the country because there is many overlappings between the ministries, there is lack of coordination, there are lots of problems in PR communication with the public. So there are some activities, there are some arrests, uh, the new government is doing everything to, to, to make, uh, to, to publish all the irregularities of the previous government, but because of the situation in the judiciary, uh, uh, we don't know what will be the final outcome of, of, of such activities. But, uh, but as I said, there is lack of strategy when it comes to the rule of law reform, because the action plans for chapter 23 and 24 dealing with the rule of law are outdated. And uh, there is no obligation by the new methodology, enlargement methodology, to update it um, uh, immediately. So we will see what will happen with the uh, action plans and with the strategy from, from the government. And with, it, with what is also connected with, with this is that we have, uh, we don't have proper negotiating structure. Uh, we uh, have, uh, we have uh, we don't have uh, key functions when it comes to the negotiating working groups for chapter chapter 23 and 24 
And even after six months, there is huge confusion uh, when it comes to the negotiation process. The, the, the chief negotiator and the rest of the team, they have not initiated any, uh, or let's say, uh, guidelines, any, um, there are no like uh, knowledge of the previous nine years of the negotiate, negotiating process with the European Union. When it comes to some positive things, so let's say that uh, the, the foreign policy, there is still no shift in the foreign policy. I'm saying there is still not because there are lots of discussions and lots of concerns because of the part of the ruling majority. Uh, it is the first place Democratic Front, which, that don't, uh, sh uh, which does not share uh, the same uh, positions uh, as the rest of the ruling coalition or the ruling uh, majority in the parliament. And that's why there is unstable support in the parliament for the government's uh, decisions. And when saying that, that the, uh, there are different attitudes and the different uh, positions when it comes to the important international obligations, uh, just to recall the, the recent case in the parliament when the Ministry of Justice denied the genocide in Srebrenica, and that was sharply, sharply criticized by the European Union and the rest of the international community. And that's why there are lots of doubts whether this uh, government is European at all. Uh, at the moment, there is still support by the European Union and the US in that direction, but we will see what will happen with, with this case because it is still not, um, uh, there is still not a removal of the Minister of Justice, Justice from the government, and uh, we, don't, we still don't know what will be the final outcome of this case. There are lots of things, but uh, I hope that there will be uh, time in the uh, discussions. Okay, thank you very much, Giovanna, for your assessment. And now I would like to pass on to Vanya. Uh, Vanya, could you unmute yourself? We cannot yeah. hear you. Okay, thank you. That's probably one of the most frequently used words uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, to, uh, can you unmute, unmute yourself? <laughs> Sorry for, uh, for that. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And um, I have to tell you, uh, I, I couldn't imagine a year ago that we would talk about this subject. I was one of the citizens uh, who was losing faith that it is possible to have any kind of change at the elections. Uh, not only because of unfair conditions at the elections, but even more because of the captured state. And that's the key problem that the new government is facing now uh, when they are six months in power, they are evidencing that on a daily basis. What it means in practice is that you have some co corrupted practices, corrupted, uh, corrupted interests, or basically private interests, which are incorporated into the laws, incorporated into the government policies. And despite the fact that you have all all the evidences that these businesses are bringing harm to the state, while on the other side bringing concrete uh, benefits uh, to certain individuals, you cannot find a legal ways to get out of such businesses. Because the whole system, the, the laws, the uh, procedures, uh, on all uh, governmental structures uh, were two years set in such a way to bring benefit to a few who were close to the government. So that's a huge challenge and it's really, really complicated to find solutions which are in compliance with international standards on one side and on the other side, which are really responding to the problems that Montenegro has. When we are talking about um, uh, uh, state capture, another problem which was directly accompanying that issue is uh, um, employment of people who were loyal to the DPS. Basically, uh, in most positions in the public administration were people who were political appointees. And I'm not only talking about top level public administration, I'm talking about so many of these small level administrative clerks, how to say, who were employed prior to the elections. In between the elections as, as a favor to someone who was actually supporting one of the ruling parties. So 
when the new government changed, they faced with a huge number of employees in the public administration, and they don't know to whom they can trust, on or, or who has a uh, specific knowledge, because some of these people were actually engaged in various trainings provided by international community, and they did develop their capacities. They are the ones who are now uh, making sure that the administration actually works, despite the fact that they were initially employed only on political basis. So can the new government really rely on these people who were, who were appointed due to their political connections, but who did gain some specific knowledge, which is very hard to gain in Montenegrin education system or in any other uh, area of work by the public administration? And that brings us uh, to the third problem. The, the new government changed some people, especially in the management positions. And initially, even when they were really honestly looking for people who are who don't have any political connections, it was very challenging to find people for certain positions which were not previously related to DPS, to their tycoons, to organized crime. Later on, as, as, as uh, previously colleagues mentioned, later on, unfortunately, they engaged in, in party employ, uh, employment themselves, mostly due to the pressures coming from the from the new uh, majority in the parliament. So uh, the new government ended up with, with new people who don't have any or have very limited experience in public administration. Even the ministers mostly have never worked in the public administration before, and they don't understand how basically the system works. Some of them who came back from abroad uh, used to work in the business or in public administration in so different societies that uh, that experience is not really helpful in Montenegrin conditions. So with such forces, they are supposed to fight a lot of the remnants of not only DPS and their coalition partners, but a lot of the remnants of organized crime structures which exist in the system. Imagine all this happening in institutions like the police directorate. Former head of police directorate and deputy director of the police were people who were not only political appointees, but people who were perceived to be connected with the top level organized crime structures. And these people were selecting uh, the, uh, and, and appointing other uh, individuals in the police who were just alike them. So, for example, in that institution, which is now supposed to deliver when it comes to fight against corruption, organized crime, not only you have a hard time finding out who you can trust and who's uh, and, and deciding who's really connected to organized crime, but finding people who have specific knowledge because they were not training uh, police officers who were capable and who were not under political control, for example, how to conduct uh, uh, financial investigations. They were training and they were sending to various study visits only people who were loyal to them and who were making sure that nothing serious the new government is supposed to work and their priorities are uh, as they say transparency fight against corruption fight against organized crime on the other side instead of having some kind of strategy and some kind of vision, how to really achieve uh, 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 that and, and, and what needs to be done, uh, having in mind all these specific conditions in Montenegro, uh, the, the government is, is trying to turn off uh, little fires that are set by mainly by politi uh, political majority in the parliament everywhere. The an additional problem is that uh, they don't live up uh, to their own statements that they are going to increase participation of citizens and increase transparency. We didn't get basic information published yet. Information about construction of the highway, even though the, we had a deputy prime minister going to the European Parliament and talking about uh, the, their help regarding such such problematic business for Montenegro, the new government still didn't publish anything new when it comes to the highway, anything when it comes to the tycoons uh, from Montenegro, which are benefiting that business or the Chinese company, which is involved. And we know that they are continuing with negotiations again behind the closed doors, just like the previous government. And that's really bad. I understand they are in a really specific situation, but uh, the, this time really needs brave decisions of the government. And one of the brave decisions would be to Publish information and to fight corruption in their own, in their own, uh, among among their own uh, members. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, 
Vanya, for that perspective. And now, uh, please turn on our, your cameras, your, um, the panelists, please, of course, uh, only in that moment. So um, we want to proceed by discussing two important questions in regards to the first six months of the new government with you. So, um, and I would like to ask every panelist to answer the question from their professional perspective uh, within more or less two minutes per person in question uh, at the maximum, so that there's then still enough time left for the question and answer section um, with the audience. And maybe to keep it simple, we would just follow the previous order with Kenneth being first, followed by Jelena being second and so on. So let's start with the first question. The new government has declared to put an end to decades of patronage and non-transparent practices of the former ruling party, DPS. <laughs> Which progress has the government made so far in achieving this objective? And how does its style of leadership differ from the previous government? Okay, so I'll, I'll pick up on that first. Um, some time ago, just after the elections, I wrote a piece, um, I think for Radio Free Europe, in which I said it was important that the opposition, now that they had come to power, didn't end up mirroring the behaviours of the DPS. Um, and I think Vanya summed it up very nicely there when she described, firstly, how difficult it is going to be to dismantle uh, the captured state. The, the DPS's influence over all aspects of you know, life in many respects, but certainly public administration. Um, now, of course, you know, the, the problem is that the, the new government um, are dealing with a entrenched, embedded system. And of course, they want to, they committed to being more transparent. They declared their wish to be more transparent. But my sense is that they've ended up kind of mirroring that behaviour of the DPS in terms of not being transparent about negotiations vis-a-vis -vis the Bar Bolyari uh, uh, road uh, negotiations over or secret negotiations over the possible restructuring of or refinancing of the debt uh, and so forth. So it's, you know, they, they find themselves in an incredibly difficult position because this government has adopted um, a very difficult set of circumstances. And if we look at any period over the last 15 years, had a government, a different government come to power in 2012, they would have been dealing with a very different set of challenges. Now they're dealing almost with a perfect storm where you have a kind of divided society, you have a terrible economic situation. They'd expected, and I think actually this is only six months since the formation of the government, you know, to be assessing what they've achieved in six months is somewhat, you know, premature because they're going to need much more time to be able to dismantle with what Vanya described as the, uh, I described the DPS as a state party. Um, Vanya described it as, as, a, as Montenegro as, as a captured state, not just by the DPS, but by organized crime. You know, to dismantle that is gonna be a very, very serious challenge. And where we end up, if the government can stay together and there are not new, uh, you know, elections, uh, if it can stay together for a four year period, then I think we'll be able to assess much better then what their achievements have been. But at the moment, it's all uphill. Thank you. Um, Jelena, would you like to, to reply to that or with your own assessment? Well, if I would have to reply to that, I would say I agree. <laughs> um, so I essentially do follow uh, on what Kenneth has said and what Vanya has uh, highlighted earlier on. Montenegro uh, is a country that's captured. Uh, it's captured structurally. It's captured in terms of, well, not all, it's captured by the national identity question at the levels uh, of society, at the level of public administration. You have heard at the, which different layers um, the state capture has happened. And obviously in the economic context, which are the things that I guess we will uh, also get to talk in this, uh, uh, in this, uh, in this webinar. So um, in this situation, you have a new government that comes and has to deal with state capture and corruption of incredible proportions. And that new government has very little experience in governing, and well, let's say it has none. Uh, so the question is, 
how these issues can be realistically approached because you can't, one can't expect uh, state capture and corruption to be wiped off overnight. So these are processes that are going to take quite a lot of time. And to be honest, my question is, but perhaps this is a question also to Vanya, to what extent uh, does the new government have the capacity to actually uh, deal with the issues of, of the captured state experience and capacity. So this is perhaps the key concern that Montenegro is facing, uh, how to dismantle a captured state while retaining those resources uh, that she has mentioned, people who have been educated to uh, run the administration. Um, as for the style of government, hmm, we pretty, but I, I can see actually quite a lot of similarities. And this is something that Jovana has touched upon when she uh, also talked about uh, the different legislative procedures that have been um, done beyond the eyes of the public. So I think that we need to essentially uh, think about uh, the possibilities and the challenges that the new government meets and their capacity to actually um, deal with them in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giovanna. I think that the government should start with the easy tasks, meaning that to include civil society more, to consult civil society more, to be more transparent, to have public discussion is a regular thing, you know, the, uh, they have to inform the citizens about they, they, their own activities. They have to produce some strategies in order to, 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 to build the, the, the structure, to, to build the rule of law culture. I guess that we are facing the same issues as, as uh, during the previous government. The new government is always using the excuses that the previous one was the, the, the uh, you know, like the, there was a war, uh, uh, that now is a better situation than, than it was with the 30 years um, ruling of the DPS and how they are now doing whatever they can to, to improve the situation, but it is still not enough, still not enough because of the captured state, captured institutions because of the situation in the judiciary, but at the same time, they are not initiating the dialogue with the opposition. The opposition is now also uh, boycotting the parliament. So we are facing the same issues all over again. Uh, polarization is deepening. And in, in that sense, they should start, as I said, from, from, the, e from the easiest tasks and the easiest task, is tasks in, uh, at the moment are to build a negotiating structure, to initiate something within the, uh, pr uh, the negotiating process to show that the EU that we are doing something uh, about the rule of law, that we are not waiting just for their mentorship and for their role and for their money and everything. And it is really important their role in the, uh, regarding the highway project and everything, as, as Vanya said. But in that sense, you know, this is also a geopolitical question and we are also facing not just uh, influence from, from China, but uh, as I said, from, from Russia and the other countries. And it's also important on a daily basis to, to, to prove that we are really, uh, there, there, there is still commitment about the European integration process, but you know, like the reconstruction of the government and everything should follow this uh, example, which I already mentioned about the Minister of Justice and about the, like first things first, our international obligations are the most important thing at the moment. And then uh, to keep with the publishing of the irregularities from the previous government and, and the rest. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jovana, and uh, please, Vanya. Thank you. Uh, well, first, I think when it comes to transparency, it's it's much easier for the new government to publish uh, information about corrupted businesses of the previous government than it is to publish about their own work. So that is going to be a test for them. But even now, we are seeing that some of the information that are related to work of the previous government, the, gov the new government is not publishing, for example, these deals 
not only related to the to the highway but also related to the oil extraction and exploration on the coast and some other issues i really expected that priority of most of the ministries will be to publish much more information and to involve public in not only in decision making but also in identifying what happened in the past so we can understand why some of the problems occurred unfortunately that didn't happen i think that the government doesn't have capacities and doesn't have experience needed to fight corruption and organize crime of such level but on the other side if the government has a vision and if the government has political will there are a lot of those who could help us with experience and with capacities in particularly i'm sure that international community is looking for some really bright example in the balkans and if the, this government can learn and, and can show that they they are interested to learn and willing to really fight against corruption and organized crime but not selectively including in among themselves then we can expect that uh, we will we will benefit from that international support i really think that uh, we should look for a concrete uh, for, for experts uh, who worked on concrete cases who would help us working on some particular cases because we don't have enough time for trainings and long term capacity building uh, projects which are usually uh, provided by the international partners. So I think working along with their experts, with their police officers, with their uh, prosecutors uh, would really make a difference. But for that, the government has to show the vision. I, I think that uh, we can we can hardly expect that um, in this year, uh, where they are having so many political challenges together with economic challenges and all the others, that this year they're going to make some significant steps forward when it comes to legislation even the budget the uh, is not yet adopted by the parliament but on the other side showing us a vision what they want to change how they want to change it for example this law on illegal um, enrichment uh, we have two draft versions of that law which were proposed by political parties both of them are terrible we have never heard from the government is that what they're going to use to work uh, on it, or they're going to use some international experiences. I mean, showing us okay. any directions where they want to go. That I'm would sorry, be, okay. I think, important for involvement of international community. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I want again to uh, remind the audience, if you have any kind of questions that you would like to discuss in the Q&A section, which will start in around about 10 minutes, please feel free to share them in the chat already uh, now so we can adjust and uh, plan a bit the uh, order and to whom to direct it and so on um right thank you so now for the second round of discussion i would like to pick up on the aspect which actually all of you mentioned which is the uh, predominance of the dps party so after the elections in august 2020 the new parliamentary majority announced that the days of the dps predominance were over so how realistic do you think that this statement is now that nine months have passed since the elections took place and what is now actually left of the DPS strength and what does that actually mean for the functioning of government? <laughs> okay, so Kenny. again, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on this first. Um, I mean, in many respects, as we've touched on before, those DPS structures, they might not be in government, but the structures that kept them in power for so long remain. Uh, the people that kept them in power for so long remain in the in you know in key positions. So the idea that the DPS would somehow crumble after the election loss, and it was a very narrow election loss. I mean, you know, the opposition won by uh, one seat in parliament, ultimately 41 of, of 81 seats in parliament they hold. Um, Neil Djukanovic remains president of Montenegro, and of course he's been very active in bouncing back, um, uh, for example. Uh, proposals the government have to appoint new ambassadors and sack, you know, uh, remaining ambassadors, some of which are, are, are very much DPS people and have been very loyal uh, to the DPS, have earned their stripes and are rewarded with, you know, choice posts in various European capitals or in the United States or at the UN or whatever. Um, so dismantling that uh, structure is, as we discussed before, a, a long-term project. So I think the DPS had an opportunity or have an opportunity to reconstitute. Um, but my sense is that won't happen. What they will attempt to do is to try and make this government as dysfunctional as possible. They will leap on every weakness, every mistake. And Vanya picked up on something really, really important earlier on. 
is the, the question of capacity. So the new Montenegrin government have, you know, the, the, the so-called technical or expert government that we were supposed to get. Actually, there's not the personnel there to be able to, you know, create an expert government. And the problem is that they are going to make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, they're going to appear weak. And when they make mistakes, the DF DPS will look to capitalize on those mistakes. So the DPS are a serious opposition and partially remain in power uh, because of their influence, because of the captured state, because they have key pe uh, people uh, in institutions throughout the country. I think it's premature to, to talk about the end of DPS rule in Montenegro, because the DPS could very easily come to power again if there were new elections, either snap elections because the, the, you know, the government, um, uh, for some reason the government falls and there's snap elections or in the next parliamentary yeah. elections, the DPS could still win. So I think it's premature to talk about uh, the DPS disappearing as a political force. Okay, thank you very much, Kenneth. Yelena, do you want to continue? Yes, and I would say again, I agree. And uh, that was my thought precisely after I listened to Djukanovic in a way concession speech in which he had announced, okay, so the DPS has lo lost this battle, but we will come back even stronger and we'll take this time to uh, reconsider um, and try to reform. Well, try to reform. I'm that's a wholly different story, but I think that in a way, I think it's this <coughs> reform will not come with actual reform of the DPS. It will come, as Kenneth has already mentioned, with them waiting and picking on pretty much any mistake that the new government does, and it has done quite a lot so far. Um, so I think that in this sense, this absolutely does not signify uh, wiping off the DPS from the Montenegrin political scene because it has been entrenched so much. It has captured the state and it has captured society. Um, what I guess this has, uh, the elections have done, have weakened uh, its political, political influence, but I guess there will be uh, a lot of time and a lot of engagement, which Jovana has called for uh, from the civil society uh, is going to be needed for the DPS uh, either to completely reform itself or to be uh, substituted by, by some new democratic forces. Thank you very much, Jelena. Jovana, please. Well, the DPS is still uh, keeping their electorate, but I think that that's their limit. Uh, so I think that the the uh, there is no chance that DPS can form the government uh, alone or with the minority minority or mi minority parties in the near future. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, they are still controlling, as you already said, there is huge uh, political influence of the previous previous government over the previous ruling uh, majority party over the judiciary, they are still controlling the public broadcaster, even the agency for anti-corruption agency. So they are still there controlling some important institutions in, in the system. And as you already mentioned, the, the president is there, you know, like from time to time, uh, he's refusing to sign some uh, laws and, and everything. So uh, preventing like normal uh, work of, of the government. Uh, the new majority, new government is still, um, they, they need even the DPS, for example, for the dismissal of the, of the Minister of Justice, and they will need uh, uh, DPS in the parliament for the reforms in the judiciary. Uh, that's why we need like two thirds of two, two thirds majority in the parliament for important decisions and the new government, new majority, has to initiate dialogue for important reforms in the country with the DPS. So DPS is still strong in a manner, in a manner that they, there are some processes which are still influenced by them. But as I said, they don't have uh, like natural coalition partners for the next elections. 
and at the moment uh, they don't uh, uh, they don't want the, the uh, snap elections because of the, of their chances to, to 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 get back to the power. So basically, they are still strong, but they don't have a chance to be again power in the next future. Okay, thank you very much for this um, for this assessment. And please, I will hand it on to Vanya. Thank you. I think the first problem of DPS is very low coalition capacity. As long as Djukanovic is at the top of DPS, uh, they will have um, huge problems in finding any new coalition partners in addition to those that they, they traditionally uh, were cooperating with. Um, I think that um, I don't think that DPS is going to uh, do, to decrease uh, uh, its its political uh, support significantly, but on the other side, it is going to be very interesting seeing them at the elections where they are not enjoying uh, various benefits of uh, being in power, using public resources, using public functions. Um, we shouldn't forget that uh, the DPS voters um, are used to getting certain benefits in order to vote for their political party. Once they are not able to give them that, we are going to see how uh, how they're going to behave. On the other side, I don't think we should underestimate the interest of organized criminal uh, structures which are uh, 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 cooperating with the DPS, not only those operating from Montenegro, but also from other countries and political interests of some countries. So in that sense, I, I really don't expect uh, the EPS to show that they're going to significantly change. Uh, on, while on the other side, it will depend very much how the new government will behave. If they decide that they're going to make some murky deals with organized crime structures, then that might strengthen them and weaken the EPS on the other side. But is that the price that we should pay for a DPS? DPS not returning into the power. I really hope not. And I really hope that it is not going to happen. On the other side, what we have to be aware of, and what I think is really good for this society, as, as Kenneth mentioned, that DPS is going to be the best opposition that we ever had, which is, which is bad news for the new government, but I think which is good news for the society. The problem is that the power that, that they have, DPS is using uh, to increase nationalism because they cannot really justify even some mistakes made by the new government. DPS cannot really talk about the substance of the reforms because they made so many mistakes in the past that now it's so hypocritical. So they stick to the national topics and unfortunately the government is giving them a lot, a lot of materials for that. Okay, thank you very much, Vanya. So thank you, everyone, uh, all discussants for the presentations and uh, uh, your assessment in the discussion rounds now. And now I would like to hand it over to Claudia for the question and answer section for the last 30 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much, Finn. And thank you very much, Kenneth, Helena, Jovana, and Vanya for um, your, dis uh, your presentations and the discussion. So we are starting to get questions coming in. So what I will do is I will take about three to four questions at a time and sort of summarize them for you and ask either the panel or individual speakers to answer the questions. And of course, um, we can also take questions, um, direct questions from, from the audience. So um, there's a, one interesting question from Susanna Vujovic um, who asks, I'd like to hear more about the role and position of minorities in the current government. So do you see an earnest commitment to minority rights from the current government? So uh, Jovana, I wonder if you wanna take this question and then if anyone else wants to weigh in. Um, there's another question of Dragos Ionita, who is a PhD candidate from the SNSPA from Bucharest, Romania. And he's asking, uh, can Montenegro's identity construction be perceived as being artificial, shallow, as it relies solely on a handful of elements, the flag anthem, and apparently new independent language? And could political pressure to internalize the new identity prove to be harmful on the long term in terms of adherence to the population, to national values and goals, both internal and external? So um, Kenneth and Yelena, um, why don't do you have a go with this question? And then there is a direct question to, to Vanya by uh, Marina Vukovic, who asks, um, Vanya, to what extent uh, have you been satisfied with the work of the National Anti-Corruption Council so far? 
So these would be this would be the first round of questions. So I should start with the uh, minority question question about minorities. It's hard to assess uh, what, who is the minority in the, in the new government. I'm just joking, but uh, uh, re, there are some uh, rumors that the people in the government were selected and they are close to the Serbian Orthodox Church. And in that sense, you know, like uh, uh, supporters of, of the previous ruling party, DPS, they are uh, not satisfied with the representation of Montenegrins in the new government, but when it comes to minorities in Montenegro, they, uh, the prime minister offered them, uh, offered them to enter the government to be part of it, but they refused to participate in it on the grounds that they are not sharing the same platforms and same programs uh, and same positions as the, uh, some of the coalition members, some of the members of the ruling majority. There are lots of tensions in in the uh, in the public um, and uh, on the social media and about the minority rights, about some shifts in, in the some ministries about you know like um, switching the the education uh, the programs in the primary and secondary schools and many many other things, and there were lots of inc incidents uh, after the elections targeting minorities in the country. So I guess it's it's not like that the the new government is um, showing the picture about uh, um, uh, about uh, inclusion of the of the minorities in in the right way at the moment. Yeah, I wonder if I can add to that uh, just a, a, a little bit. I mean, I completely agree. And one, one interesting thing, of course, is that the whole issue of how Montenegro has uh, you know, incorporated uh, ethnic minorities into the system. Actually, historically, Montenegro has done it much better than, say, Serbia. So if we look at, let's say, the issue of Sanjak, the issue of Sanjak remains uh, you know, that, that some kind of autonomy for Sanjak remains an issue in Novi Pazar, Tutin and Sienica, but it doesn't, it's not an issue in Montenegro because what's happened particularly since the DPS split in 1997, the Djukanovic led DPS could not have come to power without the support of ethnic minority parties. And as a consequence of doing that, those ethnic minority parties were then brought into the system and benefited from it. So that has kind of stabilized inter-ethnic relations within Montenegro. Um, now, the situation that we see is, is somewhat different because of course, when, when the new government came to power, there were some unpleasant um, uh, incidents we saw in Plievlia, for example, uh, which is a place which experienced, you know, real flux in the early 1990s, uh, you know, the summer of 1992, there were kind of, you know, ethnic incidents in, in Plievlia and its immediate environs. Um, so, you know, seeing things like that again are, are, are deeply unpleasant. And of course, many, uh, of Montenegro's Bosniak community, uh, Muslim community, not all refer to themselves as Bosniaks, so Muslims or Bosniaks or Albanian community do feel a little bit marginalized because the new government are so close to the Serbian Orthodox Church and many of them perceived the Serbian Orthodox Church to have played a very negative role, particularly in the early 1990s. So I think the jury's out. Uh, in terms of the new government's, um, you know, how it deals with, with, with Montenegro's uh, ethnic minorities. But um, yeah, we, we'll, we'll have to see how it develops. But the signs are, I think, there are a few negative trends there that, um, that we have to be aware of. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, to, to Dragos's question, I guess it depends on how you view identities in, in this world and whether you want to look at them through this thick versus thin identity lenses and or whether you want to engage into the old old school uh, primordial identities are it's kind of blood thick and go way back into history and the recent ones are are constructed and obviously this this uh, depends on your also normative standpoint and also uh, this will determine as to how uh, you will consider uh, national identity to be constructed and articulated 
and lived by the people. Now, this said, um, I'm going to plug uh, my article in the Slavic Review, which is called the Reconstructing the Meaning uh, of Being Montenegrin. And I'm very happy to, to send it to you if, uh, if you would like to, to read it. Um, I think that it's not about these shallow elements, because if you think about it, it's, it's more about the narratives. And as I've mentioned at my, in my first speech, uh, narratives of Montenegrin history can be interpreted in one way or another. So these narratives have been revived and re-articulated in the political context to serve one or the other sort of reconstruction of Montenegrin, uh, of Montenegrin, if you wish, national identity as a category. And I think that in this context, we should not underestimate the power of symbols. Uh, policies such as flags or anthems, etc. And I, I saw that you you come from a Romanian uh, academic institution, and for me it's interesting because to naturalize in Romania, you're actually required by law to learn the country's anthem uh, for uh, for becoming a Romanian citizen. And also the Romanian flag uh, looked much different when I was growing up than what it looks now. So I would say that these policies together with narratives underpin the reconstruction of, of national identities. And I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much, Vanya. I'm not satisfied with the results of the Council for Fight Against High Level Corruption so far. We don't have basic resources for work. Um, I, we are seriously understaffed. I don't even still have a permit to access secret information. I'm still waiting for it, even though the process started finally. Uh, I don't feel that uh, all the ministries have uh, give a fight against corruption the same priority, especially some of them. And I really think that it can be done much faster and that it's overly complicated for no good reason. I'm still trying to understand why is that happening. And I have to tell you that as, as, as for those that, that already know me, uh, it's not going to be a surprise. I'm not giving up easily. So I won't give up this time either easily. And I mean, the government can cooperate or I can challenge and push the government just like I did with the previous governments. I hope that this time it's going to be a cooperation. So uh, I hope that in, in, the, in the upcoming months, we will have some much more concrete results than we did before. Bye now. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, there are quite a lot of questions coming in uh, through the chat. So um, I would suggest to take a second round of questions um, from the chat. And then uh, in a third round, we can see if somebody wants to ask a question directly. So um, Peter Trach is asking a question directly um, to Jelena. So he's asking Jelena nicely referred to Montenegro as a state captured by the national identity question and also argue that this actually hampers this actually hampers democratization. So do you see any difference with the change of government when it comes to this aspect? So the dismantling of state capture in this regard? Then there is a second question um, um, from Elizabeth Roberts, um, and this is to all speakers. Um, how much confidence do the panelists have that the government can override the obstructionist stance of the DF on certain issues, for example, over the dismissal of Leposavic and advance the genuinely pro-European agenda to which they are formally committed? Um, and then there is another question from Sonia Dragovic who asks, what are the chances um, the new government will actually look for support, both in Montenegro, a civil society and abroad, in order to respond to all those difficult challenges? For now, it seems they are reluctant to actually open up these processes. So why should we or why we shouldn't expect this to change? So uh, Vanya, would you like to take this question? And, um, and there's a question also about foreign relations, relations which, which ties into this one, which is from Gunther Fehlinger, um, who asks, Montenegro needs a new beginning as EU member state in 2024. So my question is, um, what are the obstacles for Montenegro um, to, to become a EU member in 2024? 
and uh, to form a European consensus in Montenegro. So, uh, Jovana, I was wondering if you would like to take uh, this question. So, shall we start with Jan, so, and then the other ones can can weigh in? Okay. Um, so, to, to Peter's question, I think that's that's a wonderful question, and from from what I've seen, there has been very little <laughs> dismantlement of the national question divide by the current government. And I think that actually some of the policies that they have uh, implemented since they've taken office, and more importantly, uh, their discourse uh, has amplified the national identity division. On top of that, you have the other side, which is also mobilizing their resources uh, to, in a way, keep this national question alive. So I think that until there is a moment uh, of acceptance uh, in the whole of Montenegrin society, uh, there will it will be very, very difficult to, to overcome. The, the the division that has been created. So I I guess what Montenegrin society uh, needs is to make peace with with itself and just uh, realize that the only way to move forward is to uh, look at the state as as a thing in its own that you finance and that you expect services from. It's not something that that you actually need to identify. Uh, with in terms of national identity and push so strongly and, emo and emotionally for it. Uh, but I think that's a long way to go from now. Yeah, I wonder if I can just add to that. I think one dynamic that doesn't really exist in Montenegro, if Montenegro is going to heal and those divisions are going to be overcome, you know, we need to see the emergence of civic parties that don't use the national question as a kind of underpinning for, for their power. And you know what we haven't really seen in the 15 years of Montenegro's independence is strong civic alternatives. Yes, there are civic parties, Positivna, Ura, and so forth, but they're small and maybe they can play kingmaker or so forth, but it, it's, it, it needs a critical mass of people to be behind uh, those things, to, to not uh, pay, you know, constantly be talking about identity issues and move beyond that. But unfortunately, the way that the political system and the way that the party political system is at the moment, it's going to be very difficult <laughs> to achieve that, to overcome uh, the divisions that, that you know, still um, uh, are as acute today as they ever were uh, since, the, since the referendum. So the question about the, um, the uh, the EU membership and the, the prospects of, the, of uh, um, jo Montenegro joining the EU in three years, I guess that there is no chance that Montenegro will uh, the, the, will join the EU in, in two, uh, 2024 because we are not able to to fulfill interim benchmarks in in three uh, in period of three years. And even though that the new government will have like you know like. Um, a better approach and better activities and better track record and everything you know the ratification period lasts for a year or more so i guess that the it's not it's not just that the 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 whole membership um, story depends just on montenegro it's also on the eu because they don't have strategy for the western balkans at the moment and what are the guidelines for uh, application of the new enlargement methodology uh, in Montenegro, it's not something which is uh, new and which is the basis for strengthening the rule of law in the country. And the rule of law is precondition for uh, progressing in the negotiation talks. So at the moment, it's not quite clear how this whole story about the, the um, fulfillment of the interim benchmarks will go on. We need to update the action plans for chapters 23 and 24, and that, that will be judging by the knowledge and experience of the new government. This will last 
not forever, but for some period of time. So uh, we need to define new mechanisms. We, new, we need to adapt the negotiating stru structure to the new methodology. And that's something which is complicated in a technical manner. And the other uh, part of the story is that we still need this uh, um, uh, political will to show concrete results in practice and to just to overcome non-democratic practices which were um, somehow connected with the previous government. In a way, I guess that it's, there is no way to, to join the EU in three years, but uh, we still have to show readiness to fulfill these criteria. Mm -hmm. I wondered if it's possible that I can I can add something to that that the the external situation doesn't favour Montenegro at the moment either in terms of you know joining the European Union is there appetite within European Union member states for expansion anytime soon you know by 2024 or 2025 was always the year that was mentioned as you know Montenegro could possibly join the EU, the EU by 2025. Another thing, and uh, I have managed to get through this whole uh, session without mentioning Brexit, uh, but um, uh, I will mention it now because I think it's important in this context. The United Kingdom was a great supporter of uh, the EU expansion um, because, of course, the United Kingdom were interested primarily in widening but not deepening. Now, with the UK gone post-2016, uh, after the, the Brexit uh, referendum, um, unfortunately, one of the kind of greatest supporters of EU expansion has, has left the stage, has left the scene, and, and the UK is no longer there to, to necessarily have an impact on that or play that role. So I think that as well as, I mean, Jovanna summed up extremely well the kind of internal reasons why, you know, it may be impossible for Montenegro to join the European Union anytime soon. There are also external conditions that I think, even if always going well internally, uh, would still represent uh, a significant obstacle uh, for Montenegro. If I can just quickly jump in on the EU train, I think 2024 is way optimistic, and especially if we take into account um, the pandemic and the way it will leave uh, essentially both uh, the Montenegrin economy and society, but also the European one. So on top of the internal uh, politics and internal progress in actually closing some of the chapters, and Jovana will tell you best how many have been closed since, <laughs> since, since 2010, 2011, and that's been very few. So I think that 2024 is, is a no-goer, and I would go way uh, further into, into the future uh, as uh, when it comes to Montenegrin accession, also due to the external reasons mentioned by Kenneth. Thank you very much. Vanya, would you like to add something? So I got an easy question. Um, I agree with, with what I said. I don't think that it's realistic for us to join the EU by that date. Regarding the government and the cooperation with civil society and international community, I don't think that they have to cooperate, but if they want to deliver results, having in mind their very limited capacities, they would have to cooperate with civil society and international organizations. On the other side, if they don't cooperate with NGOs in Montenegro, we were quite well trained by DPS how to be effective in public uh, campaigning. And I'm sure that we can give hard time to quite many ministers in the government. So I hope that this government is going to be much more open for uh, cooperating with NGOs. Otherwise, NGOs will do what we used to do with Djukanovic's government and Markovic and the other governments. Uh, basically criticize them and push them to deliver some reforms. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I see that there are no questions, uh, no raised hands so far. So I will continue to uh, summarize questions uh, from the chat. And I see that we have now um, nine minutes left. So what I would like to do is like end on a sort of um, roundup of, of, of questions and there have been questions also related to the topic of sort of um, outside um, actors and, and their influence on, um, on the new government. Um, so um, there is uh, one question by um, Cheryl Cross 
who asks, how do you see um, identity in relationship to the role of major external actors? So Russia, United States, EU, China, and others influencing political developments today and in the future of Montenegro. So, and she continues, should or could the United States or NATO or EU, or I suppose all of them, um, be doing something more or different, differently to support the rule of law, development of civil society and economic growth in Montenegro. So this is a question to, um, to all speakers. And then I think um, uh, one question from our side, because I think we haven't uh, really gotten into so far into the, the issue of the Serbian Orthodox Church. So we already, um, um, so Kenneth already portrayed um, the, the, the influence of the Serbian Orthodox Church in mobilizing voters ahead of the 2020 elections. And also Jovana, you portrayed uh, the quite the big influence of the Serbian Orthodox Church and the current government even saying that they seem to be outside of law or protected by law. So recently there seem to have been um, a few confrontations between the Serbian Orthodox Church in Montenegro and the Prime Minister Stravo Kriokovic over the appointment of the new bishop of the Serbian Orthodox Church in Montenegro as well as about a contract between um, Montenegro's government and the Serbian Orthodox Church. So how do you um, assess these developments and what impact do they have on the functioning of the new government? So this would also be a question um, to all of you. So who, who would like to have first go? So let's start with the Serbian Orthodox Church and the role of the Serbian Orthodox Church in Montenegrin political life, which is really complicated at the moment. And it, it is, it was complicated from December uh, 2019. Uh, there are at least two factions, uh, fractions in the Serbian Orthodox Church, one which in Montenegro uh, or in general, one which was uh, close to the old um, Bishop Amphilochia and one which is close to uh, current, um, uh, let's say, structure in Belgrade in the Serbian Orthodox Church which, and the president, uh, Alexander Vucic, president of Serbia. And they wanted a different, different, um, um, let's say, uh, head of the of the um, Serbian Orthodox Church in Montenegro, and that's why there were calculations that the uh, Prime Minister was in Belgrade to deliver the message that uh, um, sit believers of the Serbian Orthodox Church in Montenegro wanted a different uh, head of, of, the, of the church in Montenegro and he refused to sign the contract between uh, the state uh, of Montenegro and the Serbian Orthodox Church because of that issue. But uh, there are some uh, rumors and calculations in the society that the content of the contract is um, controversial and problematic, and it, it is not in the interest of the state, and that's why there were some, um, let's say, um, some discussions in the government, and that's why this, uh, the, the, he refused to sign in that the whole procedure was postponed for October. Uh, end of, of, of October. We will see what will be the developments, uh, but uh, at the, there is interest of the public to publish the contract, to see what is in there because of, of the, this uh, polarization in the country, because of the huge tensions between the, uh, uh, between the two blocks. Uh, and because of the, the Serbian nationalism, which is growing in Montenegro, influencing the Montenegrin nationalism, and the, the role of the church, as it, it was already explained, is really, really important in the, uh, at the moment when it comes to the uh, uh, politics in Montenegro and the government. They were uh, active during the campaign, during the elections. They were meddling the, the agreement between the now ruling majority. They were stuffing even the government. They are uh, there, you know, uh, in all segments. And that's why it is really important now to have all transparent and the contract and everything and to explain what is happening uh, with all these issues.
Thank you very much. Anyone else want to weigh in? Okay, I may I may uh, comment on it, uh, but from a bit different angle. Uh, when the church started organizing the protests following in December, you know, the, the, the law on, on religious communities was adopted in 2019. So the church started the protests and the protests were ongoing during the election campaign. Therefore, we were monitoring whether the funds used for the protests are somehow used for the election campaign. And I can tell you that uh, there is no uh, provision in the law on financing political parties that was violated by the church, but that behavior and that situation certainly did show us that there are loopholes in the law that could be heavily exploited by third parties that could represent a channel for financing from abroad or from various structures, including, including the organized crime. And that's, that's something that really concerned us. When it comes to the role of the church, uh, it, it is obviously that compared to the previous period, the church has much more influence over the existing government. Even the statements given by the prime minister frequently sound like they are given by some priest or some, some official of the church. And um, unfortunately, uh, even some of the statements uh, which were related to women rights and women issues and similar uh, were uh, quite, uh, quite conservative and obviously influenced by the prime minister's religious beliefs. Uh, and of course, he has a right to his religious beliefs, but there is a problem when you mix your own personal beliefs uh, with the job that you are doing, because his job and the job of the government should definitely um, have nothing to do with the religion. We saw the mixture, just like before, you know, we had this, uh, this blurring the line between DPS and the state. Now we are having blurring the line between the state and the church. And that's one of the big challenges that the new government has to cope with. Uh, from what we are hearing is that most members of the government are actually connected to the church or to prominent members of the church, uh, like through fa their family connections, which is then uh, bringing us to that uh, discussion about patronage, whoever it is involved in this case, the church, which is obviously not the path that the new government should follow. Okay, thank you very much. So we have one minute left. If you, Yelena or Kenneth, want to uh, add a short comment to, to wrap the discussion up. Yes, just on the issue that we haven't touched uh, upon, it's this uh, issue of external actors. And I think we need to uh, think about the importance of the different actors in the context of A, this East-West narrative that underpins different identity issues. But I guess when it comes to resources, it's, it's a whole different story. Uh, and these resources obviously can be uh, purpose specific, uh, different investments that have over the past 15 years been done in Montenegro. So uh, in that sense, they can collide with the narratives uh, of the uh, of the East, uh, East and West and also the reconstruction support. Now quickly, because we are running out of time, the question what the EU and NATO should do in this respect is difficult. Because the question is, what is the actual ultimate objective, beating uh, whatever these other external actors or actually helping Montenegro to democratize? And I think that these uh, could have very, very different strategies and approaches. Thank you very much. Kenneth, do you have a last word? Yeah, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, I think it's difficult to look at Montenegro in isolation here. So if we're talking about external uh, influences and the role of, let's say, China or Russia. Um, you know, you, it, if we look at the whole region across the Western Balkans, um, you know, Russia have a presence, but they don't spend very much money doing that. But what is their objective in the region beyond keeping it uh, relatively, well, not unstable, but unable to move on towards either EU membership or in the case of some countries, NATO uh, membership. So it really plays the role of spoiler in the region. The Chinese influence in the region is, is purely economic. It's not, you know, not cultural, not the way that perhaps Russian um, uh, influence is. Um, and across the region, we see as part of the, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, you know, countries becoming increasingly indebted to the Chinese uh, as a consequence of those, those projects. So that's an entirely different form uh, of influence. I have to say, just by ending, the United States, of course, has been really... Um, certainly during the Trump presidency, wasn't particularly active in the region. 
Um, uh, I mentioned earlier on the loss of the United Kingdom uh, as part of the European Union that was driving forward forward uh, EU accession. Um, you know, and I think that the, it's hard to see how the EU and the United States can immediately reverse the geopolitical shifts that have taken place over the past uh, five or six years when, when frankly their eye was perhaps off the ball. I'll leave it there, I know we're, we're short of time. Okay, thank you very much. So, okay, that is that is it. Um, there are many, many more um, other great questions coming in, but our discussion has now uh, reached its end. So I want to reiterate my thanks to all the panelists for their participation, of course, to the Center for Southeast European Studies and to the audience for a very lively discussion. So I personally have learned a lot and I assume, assume the audience has as well, and I encourage you to read all their books and uh, latest uh, publications and um, a good evening uh, to all of you and thank you again and the final words uh, belong to Florian. Well thank you thank you all thank you to to Finn and Claudia for moderating this discussion and our panelists for for joining us from Montenegro and elsewhere um, and uh, I guess we'll have to have a continued discussion uh, another panel maybe in six months time and uh, of course until then many events at the Center for Southeast European Studies you can join us in um, just look at our website um, at the University of Graz uh, and uh, hopefully see many of you at future events online or live in Graz as well. All the best to all of you.